Ah. Oh dear. Oh dear. You can't see me, but you'll see me in just a second. <laughs> Grigri, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Shh! You've got your fans here. They want to see you. No! Where are you going? It's all chaos here. It's chaos with the video. It's chaos with the cat. And we're going to have a wonderfully chaotic lesson looking at written comprehension skills. It's good to see you all. I um, hope you've had a lovely week. I hope you've enjoyed some of the nice weather. If you haven't checked out the special cat fur, no, the special 11 plus lifeline offer where you can send me your work for marking for free to try out my marking service, have a look at the 11 plus lifeline page and there's a link there. I think this, I'll also post a link in the comments under the video. Loads of people have watched my videos and have decided to send me some work for marking and loads of them have seen my marking and decided that they, that they want to sign up for an 11 plus lifeline membership and keep sending me work. Um, but that's completely optional. You can just send me your marking for free. As I say, check out the special offer, offer Google 11 plus lifeline. I'm not seeing your comments coming in yet, but they will start coming in soon. I have faith. Okay, so today we're looking at written comprehension skills and we're looking at a fearsomely difficult text and set of questions. Aha, first question coming in from Sebastian Solomon. Hi Robert. Well, seeing as people are commenting and I know that you're there, I should also um, put a, offer a special shout out for Javi, who is doing his uh, maths tournament, maths tournament, chess tournament in Manchester, that's it, chess tournament in Manchester, not maths tournament in Chester, um, this weekend. So the very best of luck for that. And hello to everybody who's coming in in the comments, whether you're Gamer Boys or Squishy Neon 990 or Sebastian Solomon or Rizna or Bina or Y Young or anybody else. Uh, Rosner, I didn't mention you. Right, I can't mention everybody. Um, um, so let's get cracking. So this is really difficult. Uh, we've got horrible text, horrible questions, uh, all put together by me in my book, um, RSL 11 Plus Comprehension. Uh, if you want to find full written answers, go there. If you want to see me come up with some answers now, watch this video. So we've got the text here. I'm not going to read through it now, but in an exam, of course, it is essential that you read through the whole text before you start answering the questions. Now that's especially essential for this one, simply because the text is so tricky and the questions are tricky. And you need to know where to find information in the text. And sometimes the information is not exactly where you're going to expect that it is. And so reading the passage first so that you have a good overview and know where to find things, I just can't emphasize enough how important that is. So we've got the passage here. I'm not going to read it now because you've already read it. If you haven't, the worksheet is linked in the video description. You can print it out, put it up on your screen, do whatever you want to it, turn it into a dartboard. Um, we're going to focus on answering the questions anyway. So hopefully this works good. Finally, some technology is working without hiccups. Uh, and there'll be people going, I'm looking at a bird that's landed on my window ledge. How nice. Um, anyway, people will be uh, saying, don't say it's all working. You're going to jinx yourself. Uh, we will see. I don't happen to believe in that, but maybe that's my stupidity. Right, we're not going to do the whole comprehension exercise today because there's no way we have time. We're going to do some of it, maybe a third, maybe half, and then we'll come back and do more uh, next time. That's the plan. Write down... Oi! Computer, stop doing sound. That's it. I don't want to hear sound from you. Okay. Um, Frog LVR is reporting from the USA. Fantastic. Easy 11 Plus goes international. Um, someone says, when's it going to start? Okay. <laughs> Write down one word with the same meaning as each of the following as used in the passage. So what you mustn't do is just look at the words here and give the definition that you think. So for example, a broadside can mean all the cannons on one side of a battleship firing at once, for example. So then you might say barrage or something. But is that what it means here? So line 12, broadside. And we can find it just here. So the leopards here, the explorer, Mary Kingsley is looking at it. Um, if you want to see what Mary Kingsley looks like, look at the cover image for this lesson, for this video. And it's also in the worksheet. Anyway, um, I was making bad weather of it and climbing up over a lot of rocks out of a gully bottom where I had been half drowned in a stream, so she's in this horrendous storm, and on getting my head to the level of a block of rock, I observed right in front of my eyes, broadside on, maybe a yard off, certainly not more, a big leopard. 
Okay, and if you read on, you'll see that this leopard does not see her. If it was looking straight at her, it would see her. And it is broadside on. So side, it's got the word side in it. And what does broad mean? Broad means wide. So if we imagine this leopard being wide side on, that means that it's sideways on. So one way you could explain this word would be with the word sideways. Or if broadside, of course, refers to the broad side of the animal, what else could you call that? You could call it its flank. So that would also work. You couldn't say side because that's within the word anyway. So it doesn't necessarily show understanding. So I would write sideways or flank. OK, I know one is a preposition and one is a noun. And probably a noun is a slightly better fit here, but sideways would be absolutely fine. So I would write flank. Good, the technology is working. Or I would write sideways. Now you in an exam, sh oh no, it's not showing up. It's not showing up. Right, unplug, plug in. Fingers crossed. OK, quick technical hitch. Come on, computer, work, work, work. Right, I'm going to have to do some clever stuff here. Excuse me a second. So you're going to see me for a second or something. Let me go back to this. It's working. Good. Let's hope it keeps working. Now, what I was going to say is, in an exam, you should not do what I've done here. The question says, write down one word. So do not give a choice of answers. I'm just putting this to show you the two, an two answers that you might put, either of which would be good. OK, conglomerate, line 35. No expectation at all that you should know what that means. If you do, that's great. Uh, or that can mean lots of things, most commonly used uh, to talk about businesses. But anyway, be that as it may, the great conglomerate rule. Right. So she's talking about, it's a great pleasure to see the creature. He was really angry, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then she talks about the storm showing up one second every detail of twig, leaf, branch and stone around you. That's the lightning. And then leaving you in a sort of swirling dark until the next flash came. This and the great conglomerate roar of the wind, rain and thunder was enough to boil any living thing. Now, if you just look at words that could fit in that gap, which of course is a very sensible thing to do, you might think it means fierce or angry or something like that. But... Let's be smart about this. There's this prefix, con. What does con mean? Hmm. Um, well, if you, you know, if you know your classical languages, you'll know that it means with, but you'll also be used to words that sort of con, com, and so on, combined, um, conflagration. They're all quite tricky words, to be honest. It's about things that are with, it's about things that are together. Conglomerate, maybe you know things that words like agglomerate or agglomerate. Not easy still, very difficult. I said this was a difficult comprehension. But if you spot some of those parts of this word, you might start to get the idea that this is to do with things being with, being combined. And that's what it means. The combined roar of the wind, rain and thunder. Now, I'm not going to pretend at all that this is easy. I said this is a really, really hard comprehension exercise absolutely at the hardest end of anything you might actually encounter in an 11 plus exam. But that's why we're doing it, because if you can get these, if you can understand how to do this exercise, you'll be ready for anything. So combined. OK. Um, another word like, you know, aggregated or something, you know, but combined is, I think it's the simplest. It's the simplest correct answer that I can think of. Bewilder, line 36. This one's a little bit more straightforward. Was enough to bewilder any living thing. The Great Conglomerate War was enough to bewilder any, level thing, any living thing. Now this one, hopefully you know what bewildered means. So, confused, basically. Confuse here. Now what would happen if you wrote confused? Well, there were two marks available for each one. The question does not say bewildered. It says bewilder. So if you wrote confused, you might lose a mark. The correct answer is simply confuse. It would be enough to confuse any living thing because that's the meaning as given in the passage. Last one, civilly, line 50. Okay. And I civilly asked them to go ask the leopard in the bush. 
that they firmly... So it's a way of asking somebody something. Now, you may not know the word, but again, what words are similar? Civilised, for example. What does that suggest? Civilly and civilised are very similar. If someone does something in a civilised way, they do it courteously, politely, okay? Without causing societal ructions. So civilly would be politely or courteously. Okay? And there we are. My username is the best, says, I have one elder sister who makes my head pop and burst into flames. Goodness me, that sounds deeply traumatic. I guess the lesson from this is don't have siblings. Right, and now we're into the real hard stuff. Now you'll notice in the worksheet that I don't give answer space. Okay, and that's deliberate because occasionally it can turn up in an exam that they just give you a sheet of paper to write your answers on. But also because it's a really good exercise not knowing how much to write. Um, you, you know, you then have to look at the number of marks, you have to look at what the question's asking and work out for yourself how much the question requires. Now, in order to do this lesson, I've provided myself with some answer space, as you can see here, but I've given myself way more answer space than I would actually need, so, but I still have to reach the same judgments. I can see there are some people signing out of the lesson as they look at this and go, oh my, this is too difficult, I don't want this. Understandable, but stick with it. It'll challenge you and, you know, maybe that's good. Or maybe I'm just horrible. Explain the comparison between the narrator Mary Kingsley and a field mouse in lines three to seven. Let's just think about the question for a second. Explain the comparison. So you have to say what the comparison is, but to explain it, you probably also need to be clear about what it means, why it's there. And we need to talk about both the narrator and the field mouse in order to do this properly. And we have to focus on lines three to four because that's what the question says. Explain the comparison between Mary Kingsley and a field mouse. Lines three to four. Let's scroll up. Okay. So lines three to four. There we are. Let's look at the whole sentence. This is, you know, she's in a tornado, so she's in a tropical storm. The massive mighty trees were wavering like a wheat field in an autumn gale in England. And I dare say a field mouse in a wheat field in a gale would have heard much the same uproar. The tornado shrieked like 10,000 vegetable dudes. So we're moving on. So there are actually two comparisons here, aren't there? There's a comparison between the trees and a wheat field, and then a field mouse with implicitly, so by implication, her, herself. So what's it getting at here? So for her, the trees are massive. For a field mouse, the trees would be similarly massive. Sorry, if some, for a field mouse, uh, wheat would be similarly massive. So she is in relation to the trees, like a mouse would be in relation to a field of wheat. That's her forest. And how loud this sounds to her, a gale, so a smaller storm in a, but still a decent storm in a wheat field, would sound about as loud, she says. So that's the comparison that we need to make clear. I'm just checking my notes here. So, hmm. Um, so let's go straight in. Let's talk about the comparison of size and then link that to the comparison of noise and then I think we'll have explained why she's writing this because she's making this point that um, to show you know how violent and loud the storm is so is this showing yes it is good sorry about my handwriting anyone who's familiar with this channel will know it already um, wheat would seem as large to a mouse as the forest seems as the forest seems to her um, Kingsley so it's good to use the narrator's name but you could also say the narrator I wouldn't say Mary because you wouldn't normally you know talk about an author using their first name but you wouldn't lose marks for it um, Kingsley um, do, 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 do. Yeah, Kingsley thinks that 
an English storm would seem as loud and terrifying, sorry about the handwriting, to them as this tornado, and I could put that in quotation marks, why not, because it is a quote, does to her, okay? So wheat would seem as large to a mouse as the forest seems to her. So that's the size comparison, um, which talks about the massive mighty trees waving like a wheat field. That's the implied size comparison. Kingsley thinks that an English storm would seem, that is a full stop, so it looks like a hyphen, looks like a dash, so, but it isn't. Kingsley thinks that an English storm would seem as loud and terrifying to them as this tornado does to her. So have we got everything? Have we explained the comparison? Yeah, I think so. And have we, you know, given a sense of why it matters? Yes, it's to show the violence of the storm and put it in some perspective. Um, and yeah, now this is such a difficult question because there's a lot of explaining. There are two elements to the comparison, but also because the text doesn't give you all of it. It doesn't make clear we are comparing the size and now we're complain comparing the noise. A lot of it is implied. So explaining this clearly is very hard. Now what I get to do in these lessons is that I get to explain these things verbally to you as I'm writing, and that helps me to line up my thoughts. Obviously, I've also got you know my notes to help me, but um, you know that helps me to clarify. I have to explain these things clearly to real people who are you know whatever you are nine, ten years old, in a way that hopefully you have a chance of understanding. This is exactly the same thought process that you need to go through when you're writing answers to questions like these. You don't want to think this is an exam paper, I have to write things onto it. What you need to think is, imagine I've got a friend who's about my age, sitting across the desk from me, how would I explain this to them clearly and directly in a way that definitely ticks off all the points? And that's the way to think about it. Okay. Um, Someone says, I am 10. Someone says, I am 9. Someone says, 9. We've got a flaming debate about ages going on in the comments. Um, Katarina says that Messi is a goat. Um, why is Kingsley thankful that leopards are said to have no power of smell in line 19? So let's look at line 19. This is only a two-mark question, by the way. So this is not you're necessarily requiring a very long answer like all the answer space that, you, that I've given myself here. This is just so that I have flexibility. Um, and so you can see me choosing how much to write. Why is he thankful that I've said to have no power of smell in line 19? Now I should say that this is absolute rubbish. Leopards most certainly do have a power of smell. They have a very good power of smell. So she's heard this insane and dangerous idea somewhere and just seems to be running with it. Uh, but uh, she's totally and utterly wrong. Anyway, um, so not that I have much personal experience of leopards, but I have it on good authority, otherwise known as the internet. This is a load of cobblers. Uh, okay. So, um, I did not notice all these facts in one glance, for no sooner did I see him, the leopard, than I ducked under the rocks and remembered thankfully that leopards are have, said to have no power of smell. But I heard his observation on the weather, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, she saw the leopard. The leopard hasn't seen her, as you know if you've read the passage. She hides and she's glad the leopard has no power of smell. She doesn't say, because, for this reason. So what is the reason? Why would she be glad that the leopard has no power of smell? Well, she's seen this leopard. He's extremely near to her. She says he, so I'm going to go with he. Um, and then she hides and goes, few leopards can't smell. You've worked this out, haven't you? She's worried that the leopard would smell her. Why is she worried that the leopard would smell her? Okay. So what, what am I doing with that second question? So I could just say... She is glad that the leopard has no power of smell because it can't detect her while she's hidden. But is that a full answer? No, because why would she be glad that the leopard can't detect her? Because it might attack her. Well, you say that's obvious. I can hear you screaming at the screen, that's obvious. But sometimes you need to state the obvious because otherwise your answer isn't complete. Okay? Um, so, she has, 
she has um she has hidden behind rocks rocks is a quotation um and the leopard will not find her if it cannot smell her. And then we need to explain why she cares about not being found. If it did, it might attack her. Okay, so now we have a really complete explanation. Um, the question doesn't ask for evidence, so you don't need to provide quotations, but short quotations are always good for showing the examiner that you know what you're doing. But they need to be really short, one or two word quotations. You don't want to start downloading chunks of the passage because then you might not understand, you might just be copying it out and you won't get, won't get all the marks. So quotations are good, but really short one. Okay. Um, my username is, is the best, suggests an answer, thank you. If the leopards smell her, if the leopards smell her, I think yes, typo, if a leopard smells her, he will know where she is and will start attacking her. Um, I think that's pretty good. The only thing I would maybe slightly change is will start attacking her. She doesn't know that the leopard would attack her. I would say and might start attacking her. A small change. I think you'd still get the two marks there because you've clearly understood and you've explained it well. Um, okay, good. Excellent. Happy birthday, Kashinath. Uh, fantastic. Uh, lovely to have you here on your birthday. Uh, I can't believe you're doing this to yourself when you could be celebrating, but I, of course, am deeply honoured. Right, on to the next. And by the way, you may say that's a lot for a two-mark question. That's part of this comprehension being so difficult that you really have to work for the marks. As I said earlier, this is, an, this is supposed to demonstrate the kind of work that might turn up in pretty much the hardest imaginable 11 plus comprehension exam. I have seen questions like this, rarely in some exams, um, and it's good that you're prepared for them. What is meant by the phrase, I heard his observation on the weather? Line, line 19 to 20? Lines 19 to 20. There's a little bit of a typo in my question there, I think. What is meant by the phrase, I heard his observation on the weather? Let's have a look. Three marks for this. Obviously needs a fair bit of explaining. Okay, so but I heard his observation on the weather. So I slightly crossed the observation there, but I think you can still see it. And the flip flap of his tail on the ground every now and then I cautiously took a look at him with one eye around a rock edge and he remained in the same position. Hmm, nothing in there really explains it, does it? This is why I said it's very important to read the passage before you start answering the questions because otherwise you might not know where to look. But having done so, even if you don't remember it fully, you'll have a hint to read up a bit. Let's go up to line 15. His forepaws were spread out in front of him and he lashed the ground with his tail. And I am sorry to say, in face of that awful danger, I don't mean me, but the tornado, that creature swore softly, but repeatedly and profoundly. Okay. And then the next sentence isn't relevant. So then she, then she talks about the power of smell, which is our last question. And then she comes in to say, but I heard his observation on the weather and the flip flap of his tail on the ground. So what can the observation on the weather be? Well, an observation on the weather is when you observe something about the weather. I say it's a lovely sunny evening. Look at that haze in the distance though of the mountains. Um, that's an observation on the weather. The leopard is making one. What has the leopard said? Well, it, in the face of that awful danger, I mean the tornado, that creature swore softly, repeatedly. Now, is the creature really sitting there going beep, 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 beep? That's me beeping out my swear words. Um, no, of course not. This is not a cartoon animal that speaks. So what's she saying? She must be saying that it was making grumbling sounds that sounded like a human swearing about the weather. And that's the observation that she's heard. So it's real detective work here, picking through the whole paragraph, finding the right bit and understanding it. The creature swore softly, but repeatedly and, um, yeah, repeatedly and profoundly. Okay, let's go back to the answer space. So, um, 
she let's get straight in and say what she's talking about. She is, I said ordinary language that you might use when talking to a friend. She is talking about, and apologies for my handwriting, etc. etc. I'm writing on a glass screen, it limits me, but my handwriting is awful anyway, it's just not quite this awful. She is talking about the creatures. Um, sound which grumbling sound which is almost like an angry person muttering now because swore is in the past tense and i'm writing in the present one way to deal with that and there are others is to put the quotation in brackets like this it's good to put a quotation because it shows my, under my clear understanding from the text and that I'm basing my answer on evidence, but it's not wasting time with long quotes. She's talking about the creature's grumbling sound, which is almost like an angry person muttering. Okay. Um, and now here's the key point. Do we know that the leopard is actually complaining about the weather? No. Does she know that? No. She's, you know, she's humanizing the leopard, personifying it. Um, so rather than saying the leopard is complaining about the weather, you might get away with that, but it's not quite accurate. Um, say something like it is as though the leopard, so I said the creature before, oops, leap or does written, leopard, it is as though the leopard is complaining about the weather. So writing the answer, I think, is not too difficult there. The really hard thing is finding the right information in the passage and understanding it. And that is really, really hard comprehension. Um, you see people complaining about it, about SATs exams sometimes in the newspapers. And, and there are people who say, I'm an adult and I've got 25 English degrees and I struggled with this question. Well, this is one of those questions where the adult with 25 English degrees might need to think about it for a bit because it takes careful reading and a lot of thought. So if you got this right... Very well done. Kashina says, my friends are here for my birthday right now. And you're watching this. Goodness me. Uh, I'm very impressed or concerned. I'm not sure which. But anyway, happy birthday once again. Um, okay. Um, Kate says, I think the observation of the weather is good. I'm very glad. In your own words, describe the behaviour of the leopard in lines 14 to 22. By the way, um, we're getting on here. It's half past seven. So I'm going to break it off soon. It feels to me as though this comprehension might spread over three lessons rather than two. But we'll see how we go. I'm probably going to stop after this question for today, I think, because I don't want to stretch your comprehension too far. So just stay focused for this short period. Now, this is this has the most marks available of any question that we've looked at so far. So we might be using a bit more of the answer space. In your own words, describe the behavior of the leopard in lines 14 to 22. So what things do we need to think about in this question? Well, in your own words is absolutely crucial. And I've got separate videos on this because it's a very specific question type. You, when you're dealing with an own words question, the first thing to think about is what it's testing and why. And an in your own words question is testing your ability it's testing how well you understand the passage, basically. If you can take the same ideas and explain them in a different way, in plain English as though talking to your friend, then you must understand it really well. And that's why these questions are set. So you need to find your own way of stating these ideas. What it doesn't mean is just copy what's in the text and change a few words. You have to re-explain it from scratch not reusing keywords from the text where you can possibly avoid it. So I've got an itchy eye, I think it's all the cat fur. Ah, Grigri, you're a terror, wherever you are. Okay, um, 14 to 22, the behavior of the leopard. So let's look at this, right, I'm going to rub out the marking I've done so far so I can just focus on what's here in 14 to 22, that's this section here, okay. So we need to describe the behavior of the leopard. Now, this is a five mark question. It's a big section of the text to look at. Do not just plunge in. First of all, let's identify everything about the leopard what, and what leopard's behavior, okay? Crouching, let's just underline short bits where we can. Magnificent head thrown back, eyes shut, 
four paws spread out in front of him and he lashed the ground with his tail. So behavior is what the leopard is doing. Sorry to say that creature swore. Okay, so that's what we spoke about before, but it's part of the behavior. I did not notice all these facts in one glance. Blah, 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 blah. Observation on the weather. Flip flap of his tail. We've already covered those things. The swore is the observation on the lever of the weather. Flip flap of his tail. That's lashed to with his tail. So we don't need to underline those again. We're just underlining new points. Um, every now and then I cautiously took a look at him with one eye around a rock edge. Don't talk about that. That is Mary Kingsley's behavior, not the leopard's behavior. And he remained in the same position. Why am I underlining that? It seems a really boring point. Okay, important exam technique moment. Um, the question says lines 14 to 22. If you were just going to, oh dear, what have I, what's, oh, that's from before. If you were just going to talk about the other things, that would be lines 14 to 17. There's an entire five lines after that. And the only thing in those five lines from line 18 to line 22 that's about the leopard's behavior is remained in the same position. So the examiner must be expecting you to mention this. Otherwise, they would have said lines 14 to 17. So you can't miss it out and you will certainly lose a mark, I think, if you don't mention that it stays in the same position. So we got crouching on the ground, head thrown back, eyes shut, four paws spread out, lashed the ground of his tail, swore, remained in the same position. Now what order are we going to do these in? So let's keep planning a bit because we want to structure a really good answer. Remain in the same position is kind of an overall point. Let's do that first. Oh, I can change color. Why not? Let's go for blue, okay? So we'll do that first. One. Um, remain in the same position. Then what's the basic position? Well, he's crouching with his four paws spread out. Those two things kind of go together. Two, and you can do these, you can take notes like this on the text. Best to do it in pencil so you can rub things out if you want to underline other things here. Or if you've got colors, that's really good too. Head thrown back and eyes shut. We can talk about those things together. So the head and the eyes, three. Okay, um, now just to show that we're not just going through the passage in the same order, I could talk about the next two things in either order. I'm going to do the noise next to mix the order up so I'm not just copying the text. It makes it just that little bit clearer that I'm working in my own words. And then finally, we'll talk about him lashing the ground with his tail. Five, one, two, three, four, five. So remaining in the same position. What is the basic position? Crouching and forepaws spread out. What's he doing with other parts of his body? Head thrown back and eyes shut. Uh, what noise is he making the swearing? And lastly, we'll have the beating the ground with his tail. Okay, now, I'm going to have to go back to the answer space now, so you can't refer to this, but hopefully you printed out a copy of the worksheet, which is linked in the video description, which is underneath on YouTube, up there on Facebook, so you can be looking at the text while I write my answer, as I am now. Okay, and as I said, we're going to do this, and then we're going to go on to me taking your, giving the tip of the week and taking your question, just a few of them, and then we'll call it a day so that... Um, Oh, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? So that Kashinath, who's just turned 10, can go back to his birthday. I apologize if it's a her, hers, her birthday, but I'm guessing his, his. Uh, you can correct me in the comments. Okay, um, so in your own words, describe the behavior of left lines 14 to 22. So the first thing we were gonna say, deal with is remained in the same position, okay? How can we say that in our own words? How would I say the leopard remained in the same position? The leopard does not move. Okay, I'm going to shift it to the present tense to make life easy. Um, so, it does not move. Um, well, it does move. It moves its tail. It does not move from its place. I think it does not move should be okay, but it's a little bit ambiguous because it is moving parts of its body. I still think that's okay. But anyway, this is better. It does not move from its place. So we dealt with point one. Point two was crouching, four paws were spread out in front of him. Okay. Um, um, four paws, hmm, uh, front legs because the paws are attached to the legs. Front legs are um, are spread out 
Um, oh, so it's spread out. Um, um, its front legs are are widely spaced. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of my own opinion, but I think it's it's fairly obvious. A widely spaced for balance. I'm not going to say out in front of it because it's like, I don't know. It, it, um, I just feel that's not that important. Um, no, I should include that. I should include all important details. Its front legs are widely spaced for balance and in front of it. Now, the question asks for your own words. And you'll see that the original text also says in front of. But I think that's OK. I mean, I could say before it. But in front of is common English. I obviously understand. And that's the point here. Widely spread for balance and in front of it. Now, it would be better to say are in front of it, widely spread for balance. But in an exam, would I go back and change that? No, I wouldn't. I'd just push on and accept that stylistically this isn't as strong as it could be. But it isn't wrong. Um, a widely spread for balance and in front of it. Um, um, oh, crouching and it is low to the ground. Now, I could do this much more stylishly. I could have said it is it is crouching with its legs widely spaced in front of it for balance. It doesn't matter. This is fine. Um, ground isn't fine. Who knows what that word says? And it is low to the ground. Right, what was next? Point three. A head thrown back, eyes shut. Okay. Um, did he... Its head points... So, of course, you can say head again. That's the word for head. Its head points upwards. Um, but its eyes are closed. Sorry, my handwriting is degenerating as I try to move on quite quickly so as not to tire your patience too much. But the upshot is that you can't read a single thing that I'm writing. Anyway, um, that was point three. Point four. It's making grumbling sounds. And in fact, let's link that to the tail beating the ground. See, she has lashed the ground. We can say beating the floor, maybe. Um, and its eyes are closed. Um, it is... Um, yeah, it is growling in a low voice. and thumping, it's a different word, it's not using the text, I think, the floor with its tail. So we've got all our points, one, two, three, four, five, and we've got something that covers them really well. It's clearly in our own words. Yes, we've got phrases like in front of and words like head, but none of those are, none of those are crucial here. Um, the main thing is that you are re-explaining it, not repeating keywords that you might not understand and putting it in terms that somebody your own age would clearly understand and, you know, that would create a clear image of the animal. You haven't copied, downloaded the text. And what we haven't done as well is just gone through copying out what's there but changing each word because that wouldn't be a good way to do it. Let's read this aloud quickly. It does not move from its place. Its front legs are widely spaced for balanced and in front of it and it is low to the ground. Um, its head points upward, but its eyes are closed. Um, it is upward, upwards. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm being a little bit American, but who cares? Um, it is growling in a low voice and thumping the floor with its tail. Now, you can't read any of that because my handwriting is utterly abominable, but that's what I wrote. Um, not a stylistic masterpiece piece, but it really clearly gets the marks, and that's the important thing. Let's just recap the technique there. I think it's important. We're focusing on the behavior of the leopard. First thing I did, I bracketed off the section so I know what I'm looking at. Next thing I did, I went through and underlined um, everything to do with the leopard's behavior, but not repeated things. Because I don't, you know, if it says the same thing twice, I need to write about it once, right? Um, and then I worked out the order I was going to talk about things in so that I could combine points for efficiency. 
and so that I wasn't just following through the sequence in the text, and that makes it more, you know, more obvious that I'm using my own words. And then when I'd done that, I wrote the thing. Also notice that I kept checking back and forth between the answer space and the text and the answer space. Wonders of technology. Um, and that's what you must do in the exam. Now, that may all seem quite complicated, but the really important thing that I strongly believe is if you've got clear systems, clear methods for each kind of question, you'll be able to do them faster and faster and faster. And in the end, you'll be able to do all that stuff really quickly. Whereas if your approach to answering a question like this is just stare at the text and try and come up with an answer and then write it, it may seem simpler, it'll take you much longer. Have a really good system for questions like this so that you can apply it even if you're virtually asleep and then you'll be able to work really efficiently in the exam and not waste any time. Okay, I'm going to call it a day there and we'll come back and do more of this, maybe all of the rest, we'll see how efficient we are, probably just more of it, uh, next time. So let's move on to today's tip of the week. Fairly simple one this time. What is the point of studying questions like these? And you might think it's about learning to understand text better and learning to write better answers. And you'd be right. But there's one thought I really want to imprint on you. What you want to be focus on, focusing on is learning to intuit, to work out what the examiner is looking for, what the examiner wants. Because ultimately, the way to get really good marks in a comprehension test like this, in a maths test, when you're doing a piece of writing, is to be able to look at the question, look at the task, look at the style of paper, and get a really clear sense of what the examiner wants to see. Because then if you provide that, you will reliably get the marks. And that's what I've been talking about in this last question, talking about writing in your own words. We started off by saying, what's the point of this kind of question? What is the examiner trying to test? What do they want to discover about us? And that applies all through this. So we can look at the um, questions we're looking at here, and I'm desperately hoping there are other good examples. Um, so what is meant by the phrase? I heard his observation on the weather. Um, and so, you know, what is meant? So you think, the examiner wants me to show understanding. They want me to understand the word observation, and then they want me to explain how and why that's used in the text. Okay. And then you go into the text and you work it, and so on. Um, why? So that needs, the examiner wants me to show that I can clearly explain a concept. And so at the end, have I clearly explained a concept? Have I properly dealt with why she might be thankful? And so on. So that business of learning to put yourself in the examiner's head and learning to give them what they want is probably the most important skill when you're practicing for an exam. Even if it's a story writing task, it's thinking, okay, obviously they don't have a particular story in mind, but why have they set this question? What should I be focus on, focusing on to fully deal with this question and not drift off and do something else? And so on. Right, enough on that. Let's see whether there are any of... This is why I desperately look at the chat and think, Hope, hope, hope there aren't any questions. Of course, I did an entire question and answer session last time, so I'll have covered a lot of things there. Um, Sat, Satyajit says, this is a very interesting passage. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting passage too. I think Mary Kingsley, Mary Kingsley is an absolutely fascinating figure. She writes in a very, um, very individual, very descriptive way, but very distinctively hers. And the you can really imagine her experience in these things. But also as a, um, as a female explorer, in the Victorian period, she's you know she's a very remarkable figure. Um, there's a uh, another text that I've looked at in one of these videos I looked at quite a while ago about mountaineering and oh, what's the name? I can't remember the name of the female alpinist um, who's featured there. Um, for which I apologise, but you can look it up. It's one of my previous lessons. Um, and also you know another of these really extraordinary figures um, because you know. Um, being a woman adventurer at that time, you're also dealing with whole hosts of men thinking that, you know, you shouldn't be doing it or that, you know, that you should be back home doing, you know, kitchen stuff, um, knitting things, uh, that you, um, that, you know, men could be doing this better, uh, that you can't wear the proper clothes because you have to be wearing a dress and all this kind of nonsense. Um, 
you know, these are remarkable figures, people of remarkable ambition and bravery and intelligence. Um, and in both of those cases, people who wrote extraordinarily well also. Um, anyway, um, enough sucking up to historical figures. Uh, any more questions coming in? How do you get the best study routine during school days? <clears throat> you're asking the wrong person. You're asking the person who used to, when I was at day school back until I was 13, 14, I used to do all my homework on the bus to school in the morning. So I definitely didn't have the right study routine. But I survived, so I guess that's a terrible example. Um, I say this all the time. You need to learn a routine that works for you. Um, and it's partly about having a healthy relationship with electronic devices and not getting sidetracked by social media and games and so on and putting aside enough time to be able to study. But it's also finding the rhythms that work for you. You know, you learn, you will learn how often you need a break um, to study most effectively, how you can insulate yourselves from the distractions of your home, all that sort of thing. And that's why 11 plus is great in some ways, because you're now old enough to start to work these things out for yourself rather than just being told by an adult. Um, but I'm afraid the best study routine is the best study routine that works for you. And that will be different from the study routine that works for Katerina Mack or Niala Balagun or anybody else in this chat. Um, how do you get better at comprehension questions, asked Niala? Um, it's a perfectly reasonable question. But to be honest, my answer would be watch my videos on comprehension because I've got so many of them. And I talk about this in much more detail there. I think in some ways the most important thing, things that I would say I've already said in this lesson, actually, one of them was come up with really good systems that you can repeat, even if you're not feeling great and not feeling that right that day. Um, like the system I showed you for dealing with an own words question. And um, um, yeah, another thing I also said, it was my, you know, my tip of the week is learn to get into the mind of the examiner and work out what it is that they want to see. And that will also help you enormously. Um, but yeah, watch my video. So that's going to be really helpful. In the in the video description, there's a link to a file that lists in one Word file that you can download all of my videos with a link to all of them. And that can that might really help. Um, um, someone is complaining about somebody else and their comments. Uh, I can't see. Maybe I'll have to check. Um, but I can't do that right now. Um, please don't make inappropriate comments in the chat. It spoils it for everybody. If there are lots of them, I then have to just remove the chat from the video afterwards so everyone's comments disappear, which would be very sad. Um, the one and only says, Hi, Rob, I've been watching you for two years and you helped me greatly helped me excel, excel in my exam. Thanks for the help. The one and only, I am um, really pleased to hear that. And I'm honoured that you should be back even after your exam to watch this. Now, there was another good question. Sorry if I missed them. People asking about particular schools. I prefer to avoid that in these comments because it's not useful for everybody. I'm sure you can understand. Robert, can you do something special for the 100th live? Maybe I haven't thought it, but thought about what, but yes, I should. Um, have you heard of Rochester Grammar School? I think so. Um, how do you get better conversion? I've answered that. Um, 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 um. Katarina says, what are the best papers? Oh, thank you for this wonderful question. Of course, the best papers are in 11 plus Lifeline and in my RSL educational books. Look at the RSL educational website, look at the 11 plus Lifeline page. There are free samples that you can uh, download and have a look at. Uh, what I especially like about my own papers uh, is that there's a real mix of difficulty level and they look like lots of different exams. Um, but crucially that they contain really detailed example answers and discussions that tell you exactly how to put the answers together. So you're never, you're never stuck and you've got model answers to copy, to change a bit, to make into your own so that you can learn by imitating rather than just floundering around. And I do that because I think it's really useful. Um, Remke says, how do you get better at algebra and using a protractor? Also, where do you live? I live in your mind and in your nightmares. Um, how do you get better at algebra? I have various videos on this. How do you get better at using a protractor? I don't think I do have videos on that. Maybe I should. Good point. I wonder how I'd set that up. I'd need, so I'd need to kind of point my camera down and show it on a bit of paper. Hmm. Something to think about. Good idea. Um, Robert Stupendous the Great. Thank you for using my correct titles. Um, what kinds of comprehension come in the 11 plus exam? Lots of kinds. I mean, the two main kinds are multiple choice and written answers. We looked at written answer comprehension today, but some exams, for example, the CSSE exam in Essex can mix up both. Some independent exams do that as well. Can you do an extra hard maths lesson? Well, I did a series of extra hard maths lessons 
just a few months ago now, the, the ones based on that paper about parrots. Uh, have a look for those. Uh, if you look at advanced maths, you know, for, maybe put easy 11 plus advanced maths into a YouTube search and you might find them. The other thing to do is look at my list, list of all my videos, which is linked in the video description. Okay, people can ask you for number codes. I've got some letter and number codes videos on the channel already. Have a look. Um, they're in my shorts, I think. In my shorts? In my collection of short videos is what I meant to say. All right, everybody. Um, before I say anything else accidentally uh, not quite right, uh, I should call us today. Have we got a cat? Have we got a cat? What? Oh, yes. Poor Dimitri. He's nearby. He's drawn the short, short straw. Uh, so he's going to become... He knows Dimitri is not a big fan of appearing under the public gaze, he's a bit shy, but here he is nonetheless, here is Dimitri to say goodbye. So here's Dimitri to say goodbye to you. He thanks you for your wonderful questions um, and he very much looks forward, look forward to seeing you next week and he can't believe that Grigri behaved so badly at the start of the lesson. Look at Dimitri here, look how good he is. How's this for a good boy? How sleepy he is. How absolutely enormous. You're an enormous cat, Dimitri. You're an enormous cat, all seven kilos of you. All right, and he's barely more than a kitten. He's only one of the tiny bit. You're a beast. You're a chunk. All right, everybody. Um, um, the one and only says, thank you for the lesson. Probably my last one, but thanks for everything. Because of course you've done your exams, haven't you? Well, you deserve a break. It's been wonderful to have you on here. It's wonderful to have you all on here. I look forward to seeing you next week, next Tuesday evening at six o'clock for the next Easy 11 Plus Live lesson. And do check out the 11 Plus Lifeline free marking offer in the meantime, if you want Dimitri to give Set to assess your work with personalised videos and voice comments going through your work line by line, telling you how to do it better, and smashing your lights. Not quite smashed, it survived. Alright everybody, bye bye. Oh, cat fur.